In 1939, doctors began splitting living human brains in half in order to treat severe forms of epilepsy. If that wasn't weird enough, no one was prepared for what happened next. The surgeries didn't only cure the patient's epilepsy, but fundamentally upended our understanding of human consciousness. In fact, many neuroscientists point to the experiments that came after these surgeries as evidence that there's not just one you living inside your brain, but potentially dozens or hundreds of different yous always competing for control of your body. Now, that may sound, well, frankly insane, but before you flip to the next video in your queue, there's someone that I want you to meet. This is Joe. Seven years before this was shot for Scientific American Frontiers, surgeons cut the corpus callosum that connects the two sides of his brain. I know left hemisphere and right hemisphere now are working independent of each other. But... The corpus callosum is the brain's information superhighway. It transfers an immense amount of information every second and unifies the brain into a single coherent structure. In most cases, this is exactly what we want to happen. But when Joe had epileptic seizures, a rumble that began on one side of the brain could quickly travel through his entire brain over the corpus callosum and result in a dangerous condition called a grand mal seizure. Severing it made his symptoms much better. But more importantly, for our purposes today, it also gave scientists a unique opportunity to study how the two halves of a human brain operate independently from one another. It was time to experiment. The brain's unique wiring means that each eye connects directly to the opposite hemisphere. So the left eye sends images to the right side and vice versa for the right eye to the left hemisphere. This means that it's possible to send visual information to one hemisphere at a time. And when the corpus callosum has been cut in two, that the half brain must process that information all on its own. For reasons locked in our evolutionary past, the left hemisphere here contains the language center and thus connects to the right eye, while both sides share the motor cortex, left hand, uh, right side, and right side, left hand. This means that if you show a picture to the left hemisphere, it can respond with words, while the right hemisphere can only communicate with gestures and with writing. The researchers wanted to know what would happen when one half of a person's brain got different information about the world around it than the other half. How would each side integrate its knowledge of the environment when the other half disagreed about what was going on? In a novel experiment, Michael Gzaniga, a neuroscientist, showed Joe a computer screen that displayed a handsaw on the left side of the screen and a hammer on the other. And the neuroscientist asked him what he saw. Since his language cortex could only communicate about the right side of the screen, because things were sort of like partitioned off, he responded that he saw a hammer. What did you see? Then, when they asked the other side of his brain what appeared on the screen, his left hand, and thus his right hemisphere here, drew this, a handsaw. When asked why Joe drew the handsaw, the other side of his brain that controlled the language center said this. That's nice. What's that? Saw. Yeah. What'd you see? Hammer. This moment is super important. When we talk with our mouths, the assumption is that we are speaking with our own full and unified conscious selves. To an outsider, Joe seems completely sincere in his words, and yet he's simultaneously in disagreement with his hands. There are two Joes in Joe. 
In a similar experiment from the 1960s, the neuroscientist Robert Sperry presented the image of a bell to a half-brained patient, or to a split-brained patient, and then asked the language-holding side of the brain why it drew that bell in the first place. The patient explained that he must have seen a bell on the way to the lab that day. In other words, the language-using side of the man's brain decided to make up a story about the unfamiliar picture rather than admit that the brain was having two separate experiences at the same time. This experiment has been repeated on dozens of people with split brains over the years, and it's always the same. It leads to the seemingly impossible conclusion that the human brain isn't one integrated, complete self. Rather, it's multiple potential selves depending on how much of the brain is active at one particular moment. Yet on a daily basis, the surgery didn't really change Joe's life all that much. Uh, you don't notice it. Now, you just kind of adapt to it. It doesn't, you don't have any feeling, it feel any different than it did before. Despite the two sides seeing, experiencing, and reasoning in somewhat independent ways, there's a neurological step in human consciousness that then recombines disparate data into a sense of a unified self. To me, this is evidence that our natural unified self is an illusion that our brain invents to make it easier for us to navigate the world. The data suggest that at a minimum, there are as many potential selves inside our minds as there are discrete and autonomous sections of the brain to process experience about the world. And if you thought that wasn't far out enough, maybe this is all just the tip of the iceberg. Perhaps consciousness writ large isn't really a thing that exists in any one place at all. Maybe we can only understand it as an activity that exists between things in the synapse between different cells, organ systems, organisms, individuals, and even ecosystems writ large. In my book, The Wedge, I write that the relationship between our bodies and the environment is eerily similar to the experiments on split brains. Who we are at any one moment depends on the accumulation and processing of all our previous experiences. Who would any of us be without our childhoods or education, first loves and triumphs and crushing defeats? All of those things shape our personalities at the same time that they change our biologies. We respond with hormonal signals and neurotransmitter releases. These are physical processes. And the same process goes on inside the cells of our own body. Now, if I'm anxious all of the time, I'm gonna be dumping adrenaline and cortisol into all of my, into my bloodstream, into my cells, and all of those things experience whatever is happening outside the body as a bath of these hormones. Alternately, if I'm lying on a beach, relaxing, the hormones and secretions uh, that my immune system experiences are altogether more oriented towards resting. For them, I'm a lens onto the outside world that they can never directly connect to. Now, on the other hand, what happens in my body also has an effect on my own personality. As anyone with a leaky gut or chronic anxiety can attest, the action of those cells can radically alter a person's mood for the better or for the worse. There's a constant feedback loop between our inner worlds and our outer worlds. In The Wedge, I write that I am part of a great living ecosystem that works on scales as large as tectonic shifts, but also at the infinitesimally small level of the microorganisms inhabiting my gut and the autonomous cells of my immune system. I live in an ecosystem at the same time that I am an ecosystem. And everything together is part of the great superorganism of life itself. This doesn't seem intuitive, 
But in my opinion, our unique perspectives on the world are really just one link in a continuous chain of subjective experience between the very smallest molecules in our bodies and the universe itself. Consciousness is mostly just context. These split-brain experiments prove this point at an anatomical level. Who we are is not who we think we are. We have a perception that our whole brain somehow adds up to the experience of a self. And yet, when you start parsing out how information in different parts of the brain reacts to the environment, the illusion comes crushing down. Experience is only a container for context. Maybe consciousness is merely the experience of different contexts happening. As Alan Watts once said, you are the universe becoming aware of itself. At first, this realization can be alienating. It doesn't feel intuitive at all because we are predisposed to think that who we are originates from the unique perspective of our bodies. We point to our heads and tell you that Somehow, I'm in here. I'm, I'm in this head somewhere. But am I really? I'm only here insofar as what it feels like to be me. Meanwhile, just like a split brain, you have you, you viewer, have an entirely different experience of me than I do. Right now, as you watch this video, I am changing the way that your brain organizes data. Whether you like it or not, merely experiencing my voice alters the way that your neurons fire, and it creates an imprint of me in your physical tissue. That is to say, because you watched this video, there is a little bit of me in you right now. Yeah, that's super creepy, but it's also the way consciousness works. If you comment on this video down below and I read it, you will have reached through the wiring of the internet and altered my own sense of self. That's because we are all connected. We're all working on this great project of consciousness together. That's how our brains work and that's how, well, everything works all at once. So what starts as research on brains that have been cut into pieces shows us how, in reality, we're all one. Split brain research continues to march forward and all of the most recent papers indicate how much more still needs to be done. Questions still abound about whether or not divided brains have way of communicating between the hemispheres or through other pathways. And for that matter, what experience really is at all on a neurological level. Ultimately, answering some of those more thorny questions might require entirely new scientific approaches altogether. So thank you so much for coming with me through this video. If you've had an opportunity to read my book, The Wedge, you'll know how we can use this knowledge of a unified consciousness to alter the way our internal biology works on a very real level. We can use it to build resilience and even communicate with the activities of our immune system inside. If you'd like to know more about how our unified consciousness could theoretically reach all the way back to the origins of the universe itself, check out this video I made about what happens when we die. Or, you know, perhaps this slightly longer video where I talk about how we can use our sensory system to insert a wedge between consciousness and biology. Thank you so much for being here. And I really appreciate it. And there is so much more to come. See you soon.